Hello and welcome to It's All Right with Suzette. I'm your host, Suzette Martinez Standring, and we're going to spend the next 30 minutes talking about the craft of writing. And today we have mystery writer extraordinaire Hallie Efren with us today. She's in the house to talk about her new book, You'll Never Know, Dear. But let me tell you just a little bit about Hallie. Hallie is a New York Times best-selling author, an Edgar Award finalist, and five-time finalist for the Mary Higgins Clark Award. And her writing has been described as deliciously creepy. And today, we're going to talk about her new book, You'll Never Know, Dear, which I did read. It was a wonderful mystery from start to finish, and I can't get I can't wait to get into it with Hallie today. So welcome, and thank you for being on the show today. Well, thank you for having me. I, I love being on this show, so thanks for having me back. Hallie, I want to dive right into the delicious creepiness, <laughs> and it really was, of your book. So give us the storyline, the premise about your book. Well. The, I, the idea, let me just say first, the idea came to me at, in Milton. I was standing online waiting for my class to start at Fitness Unlimited, which as you know is in East Milton Square. And my friend Mary Alice uh, Gallagher. Gallagher, yeah, um, was there and we we're chatting and she's telling me about her mom, who she just was in the South. She was in, um, where was she? She was in North Carolina in Fayetteville helping her get out of a house that they'd lived in for years and years. You know what that's like. Her mother was a doll maker. So when Mary Alice was clearing out the house, she would reach underneath the bed and pull out boxes that were underneath and open them up, and they would contain doll parts. Eyeballs, heads, <laughs> bellies, legs, wigs creepy, right? And uh, she said to me, put that in a book. And it's the first time anyone has ever said that to me that I did. Uh, people tell you that all the time, and I always say, no, no, that's your book. But Creepy Dolls is right up my alley. So I started with the idea that there was a woman who made dolls. She made porcelain dolls. And as I looked up porcelain dolls, I found out what a complicated thing it is to make a porcelain doll. You have to pour a mold, you have to take the piece out, mm -hmm. you paint it, and it's a, quite a complicated thing. And then there are people who make portrait dolls, which are dolls that look like real little girls. And I thought, well, dolls are creepy, but that is creepy squared. That is truly <laughs> creepy. Creepy squared. I know. So I thought, well, okay, my character's mm -hmm. going to make portrait dolls. The first two she made were for her daughters. And when the children were four and seven, and playing outside with their dolls, the four-year-old was kidnapped, taken away. And the book is going to start 40 years later, The Doll Comes Back. Fantastic premise. Yeah, so that was my starting point. Now, did I know anything else about what was going to happen in the book? Very little. I just usually, that's the starting place for me, is writing that opening scene. Uh, which is the opening scene in the book, The Doll Comes Back? Well, your book, You'll Never Know, Dear, has been very successful mm -hmm. since it's published in 2017. It was named a finalist for the Mary Higgins Clark Award, an Earphones Award winner, and one of the top 10 mystery and suspense audiobooks of 2017 by Audiophile. So tell us more about where this story is set. Yeah, you know, um, all of my books have been set either here in Milton, Yes. Although I never call it Milton. My new book, which I just finished, uh, is going to be set in Milton. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah. Uh, but um, this time I thought I just couldn't feature a woman who makes porcelain portrait dolls living in Milton. I don't know why. Something about New England, it just felt mm -hmm. off. And knowing that the real woman who inspired the story lived in Fayetteville, North Carolina, I thought maybe she should live in the South. Well, you know, my idea of the South is Florida, which is not the South. <laughs> Washington, D.C., not the South. I've been to Virginia. That's probably oh. the closest. But I wanted somewhere that was really Southern. And the only place I've ever been in the South for any more than an airport stop is Beaufort, South Carolina. Uh -huh. Have you ever been to Beaufort? No. 
Well, I recommend it. Everybody should have it on their bucket list. It's a really beautiful, beautiful southern town on a river. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's just gorgeous. It's halfway between Savannah and uh, Charleston. Mm -hmm. And um, so I decided that would need to be where the book would be set. And of course, I'd only been there as a tourist. So I went back for a week, just myself, and a tape recorder, and a notebook, mm -hmm. and a camera. And I paid attention because I listened to how people talk. I listened to how they addressed each other, how they drove. I paid attention to you know, I, it was March when I went down, so I had to set the book in March because now I only knew what the vegetation was like in March. You know, that there were um, uh, pecan trees everywhere. Mm. And so underfoot, there were all these pecans when you walked on the on sidewalks and that the sidewalks were made of, um, I'm not remembering the word for it, but it's basically crushed shells yes. and cement, and it's called tabby concrete. And so all these little details, I just wouldn't have known if I hadn't gone. Now what I did find also was that Beaufort has an amazing history. Some of the characters in Midnight and you know, Midnight and Garden. Exactly, that's what it made me think of. Wacko characters, uh -huh. and half of them come from Beaufort. Well, Beaufort has this really amazing history. It had a white voodoo mayor who, I, I, just all these stories about him, and there's a bridge named after him. And my book needed to have a mayor who'd been there for 40 years, and there was this mayor that had been there for 40 years. So I, di I, didn't, I didn't have time or the inclination to learn enough about him to put the real guy in the book. Well, I think that you had a fabulous sense of place. Oh, good. Because that southern setting was wonderful for the pacing of the book. Yeah. Because the story's unfolding in its creepiness and the characters and what I really loved about it was because you said it in the South, there was such a believability about how everybody knew each other, how everybody was uh, very um, bonded relationally and they knew each other's backgrounds and they knew the story of this kidnapping that took place 40, 40 years, years ago. Earlier, yeah. And you know, with regard to the relationships, what I also found fascinating is that it centers around four women, mm -hmm. three generation, uh, three generations of women from the same family. You have the grandmother, um, Sorrel, Miss Sorrel. You have her daughter, Liz, who was the sister of the kidnapped um, girl. And then you have Liz's daughter, Vanessa. And then you have the best friend of Miss Sorrel, who is Evelyn. And I thought that that was a really interesting dynamic. And I wanted to ask you why you chose that particular dynamic um, for the story. Well, I think, you know, I found as a writer, I have a few sweet spots. One sweet spot is creepy. Yeah. So that, hence the dolls. But the other one is uh, generations of women. Oh. I really like to write generationally. I like to have a character who's quite old and thank you very much still holding on to her marbles. I like to have someone younger who can give us some perspective on that character. And I like you know, the 30 year olds. So I liked, so the, the middle one is my age, looking up to the, you know, Miss Sorrel, who's, who's well into her. I guess, I don't remember how old I made her, but I, at least 80, I think. And I just, I really like the idea of family and how all of that shared experience shapes uh, how you deal with each other and the expectations that you have. And then you have the outsider, you have the neighbor, Evelyn, mm -hmm. who's the best friend of Miss Sorrel, attached at the hip since they yes. were uh, young married mm -hmm. women. Mm -hmm. and, and, but an outsider. And so I just, and, and secrets. See, secrets are things that you earn over time. Mm -hmm. And um, there is a big secret in this book, which I hope yes. we won't no, spoil. I do. No, we yeah, are not. No spoilers. A, a big secret in this book. And, uh, and some people know it, and some people don't. 
Yes. Yeah, and that plays into the generations, people who've known each other for years and years and been keeping secrets from each other for years and years. And as you said earlier, the doll of the abducted daughter shows up yeah. one day mm -hmm. and it and it throws into the forefront the dynamic and how this abduction has affected each of them. Each of them. You have Miss Sorrel, her grief, 40 years having lost her child, and the guilt of her daughter, who was nearby when it took place. Supposedly watching her sister. Yeah. Supposedly watching her sister and who blames herself. Yeah. And then you have the, um, the granddaughter, yeah. who's trying to make her own life in a lot of ways in Rhode Island. Trying to get away. Trying to get away, oh, yes, yeah, yeah. over this um, this kind of this sorrow and this cloud that has hung over their family for forty years. Yeah. You know? So, how did you go about um, drawing from that kind of emotion to make it so real on the pages for each of them? That's a tough question. I mean, I think, uh, I mean, my experience with writing is that you write your way into characters. That mm -hmm. the characters you put on the page on page two, page 10, page 20, evolve as you're writing mm -hmm. and change, and your understanding of them evolves and changes. That big secret, I didn't know it when I started writing the book. Really? No, I didn't. So you didn't uh, have your ending ready to go? Oh, I definitely didn't have my That's ending ready to go. That's interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I knew who the bad person was, okay. but I didn't know why, mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. pretty important. Yes. Yeah, and so... Uh, Which was masterfully crafted, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. And I'll say no more. All I knew at the beginning <laughs> of that book was that doll parts, you know, those doll parts that Mary Alice found under the bed, that they were going to be pivotal for the ending. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's all I knew. Yes. So making that work was the, uh, that click at the end, uh, like a Rubik's Cube. Click. Yes. Well, out of the four women, um, who posed the greatest challenge in uh, her character yeah. development? Well, let me say that one of the hard things for me with this book was figuring out who the main character was. Okay, yeah. yes. Usually you know, but mm -hmm. I had three women. I knew one of them had to be the main character. I, it took me a while yes. to realize that the middle one, Liz, yes. and she's the one who's got the most guilt. She's got the most to get right this time, um, was the main character. Miss Sorrel, I couldn't make her the main character because she knows too much. You cannot put the right, the reader in the head of the character who knows all the secrets. Mm -hmm. Because why wouldn't you then share that with the reader if you're in their head? So that's the, that's the tricky thing about writing a mystery, is once you give a character a viewpoint, if you're gonna play fair and readers expect you to play fair, you have to share what that character knows. And so that's why very often, it's very rare to find uh, the villain narrating, for instance. Which is why I think, just as an aside, uh, a book like Gone Girl is so brilliant, because you are in the head of the villain. Mm -hmm. Yes. But you don't realize it, yeah. And yet you don't feel cheated at the end. So I'm not that good a writer. She's an amazing writer. Um, so I avoid being in the head of a character who's either the villain or knows too much. Well, I have to say, I think you're pretty brilliant, and I wouldn't be surprised if this goes to a movie the oh, same way that. your other book, Never Tell a Lie, became a Lifetime movie. Yeah. I mean, this one really is visually um, imaginative, and I really enjoyed the interaction. In a moment, we're going to return with Hallie Efren, and she's going to talk more about her new book, You'll Never Know, Dear, and we're just going to take a break. So stay with us. And we're back with Hallie Efren, mystery writer extraordinaire. And I want to ask you some more questions about your terrific book, You'll Never Know, Dear. Now, Hallie, there was such a tension in the story and intensity and a great tension among the characters. And I'm fascinated to know how you go about creating that suspense within a story. Well, I think suspense comes from two places. It depends on the kind of suspense you're writing. One kind of suspense comes from the setting. 
It comes from the shadows, from the things that you can hear but you can't see, mm -hmm. uh, the, from the thing in the room that doesn't make any sense, like the phone that's off the hook when we used to have phones, uh, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> or the water that's running when there's no one in the bathroom. Right. Those, or the dog that should be coming to the door to greet you that isn't there. These are all ways of creating uh -huh. that sense that something's not right. Yes. And slowing down. I think suspense needs detail and slowness. Now, the other way of building suspense is to let the reader know more than the character knows. So a character who's walking to her car in the morning isn't very suspenseful unless you know that there's someone in the bushes watching her. But if you know that, mm -hmm. and she drops her purse, and she leans down to pick it up, and she turns around and goes back to the house, and then comes back out again, there's, it's laden with suspense, because the reader knows what the character doesn't. And I play with both of those things, trying to, depending on, the, on when uh, in the book it is, and what exactly. Uh, so in this book, I'm trying to remember, I have two narrators. Uh, so that immediately means that the reader is going to know more than the characters who are narrating mm -hmm. because you've been in the head of another character, so you know something that the character whose head you're in right now. Now, I'm talking now viewpoint, which is very wonky, and most readers are completely unaware of viewpoint, but it's the first thing that bops you in the head when you start to try to write. And you know, it's interesting in the creative process, I think that people are always fascinated because you said that you did not know the ending, right. which, um, which is something they always tell you in a writing workshop. And I remember I had this conversation with Hank Philippi Ryan also, um, that you didn't have a planned ending. You were just going along to see where everything led you. And along that line in your creative process- Let me just stop you for okay. a second, because that's not the way it is. No. The way it is, is I do have an ending planned, but I'm wrong. If I didn't have an ending plan, I wouldn't be able to write. So that's the difference between me okay. and Hank. I don't like not knowing where I'm going. I think I know where I'm going. Okay. But I almost always turn out to be wrong. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. So All right, thing. that's good. That is a very different thing. Mm -hmm. So I guess I would love to know, as you are in this creative process, it must be second nature for you to know that, okay, I'm because it's so perfectly paced, your book. Thank you. So you must know on an intuitive level or an experience level, this, this needs a little bop up of a, a suspense. I need to start to put in this. So it's an intuitive thing for I, you? It's very intuitive and it doesn't happen in the first draft. Okay. Uh, the first draft, you're just trying to figure out what the heck happens next. Uh -huh. And very often I'll, ha I'll write something and I'll then reread it and I don't like it because it's too predictable. I see. That's because my first idea often isn't my best idea. But having seen that idea on the page, I think, well, what if, and I have a better idea, mm -hmm. and then I'll rewrite it. Or sometimes I have to rewrite something earlier. So my process goes like this. I'm constantly churning, going back, going back, going back, and trying to get it right. Um, as opposed to people who can just write in one direction and go back and edit. But the, 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 the suspense, the business of it being paced and not boring, mm -hmm. uh, so you don't feel like putting the book down, that comes in editing. That's in the second draft, the third draft, the fourth draft, the tenth draft. And it also comes out of the comments from my editor and my agent, who are great at pinpointing those spots where the book is flagging. And I go in and I cut or I add, or I tighten. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's, you know, you build the car, but then you go in and you, and you. Tweak it. Tweak it a lot, a yes. lot. Yes, yeah. Well, there's a lot of nuances in your book that I found really interesting. And a, you were talking earlier about how doll body parts yep. was a starting point. And what I loved is that you also textured your story with additionally strange and compelling things. For example, the granddaughter Vanessa is involved in sleep and dream research, yeah. which I found to be pretty fascinating yeah. because it also takes you into this avenue of the imagination mm -hmm. that is that has, in her view, a practical application in real life. Mm -hmm. So do you want to talk a little bit about that? Dreams have always fascinated me. Um, 
I'm going to tell a little side story. When I was first starting to write, the very first book I ever wrote, attempted to write, was written with a friend who had a terrible thing happen to her. Her brother was murdered. Okay. In the aftermath of that murder, she had vivid waking dreams of him coming into the room, talking to her, visitations. Mm -hmm. She was not making that up. I have no doubt it was her mm -hmm. dream self dreaming those. I certainly don't. But she didn't know what it was. She yes. thought he was really there. And so I did a lot of research at that time into dreams, into, and, and I actually wrote a piece for um, a New Age magazine, believe it or not, uh, about it. Um, so I've always been really interested in what exactly is it that dreams are? Mm -hmm. um, and I have a healthy dose of skepticism when people say, oh, if there's a teacup in your dream, it means you're going to have a visitor tomorrow. I mean, that's ridiculous. But I do think that dreams are a way of working out things. Absolutely. I and, agree with you. Yeah. And mm -hmm. the anxiety that you feel in the day, if you can get to sleep, is are, are often things that you dream about. I'm mm -hmm. forever dreaming about not having enough time to pack. You know, I have a bus to catch and I can't pack my Because you're always on deadline. That's, and I, that is exactly what it is. I am always anxious about something that I need. And then I can wake up and think about what it is. But the other thing that I learned about was um, sleep paralysis. Oh, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where a, apparently a quarter to a half of people have this experience where they sense they're sleeping and they sense a presence in the room and they open their eyes and there's a figure at the foot of the bed or something like that. I've had that the experience. There you go. And I absolutely and you cannot could move. not move. Cannot move. Even though I tried to. And it was the first time I ever saw it in your book, mm -hmm. that experience addressed. I didn't know it was a yeah, thing. Sleep it is a thing. I didn't know it was a thing. Yeah. And that's another, that'll be another show another time. But your book opened up a very fascinating realm to me about sleep and dream research. Mm -hmm because it added another layer of interesting possibility to yeah. the mystery at hand. Yeah. Good, I'm glad. I mean, one of, the, one of the things that they have found is that um, it's possible to control your dreams. Right, vivid dreaming, which is, yeah, lucid dreaming. Lucid dreaming, mm -hmm. and uh, it might be a way of treating PTSD where people repeatedly experience whatever the trauma is that created the trauma, the, the, the aftermath of it, the terror, mm -hmm. um, and that they can stop the dream and change it so that uh, they're not terrified by it, but they take control. And that's also fascinated me, that, that whole thing. So I made up that uh, thing about the dream catcher and that's I was all, going to say, because up. at the end of your book, I, I, you do address I do that, address that you, it, yeah. you made up the dream catcher. However, everything's in the realm of possibility. That's how I feel, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? We yeah. just haven't gotten there in research yeah. yet, but well, you might we'll be see. ahead of the, you might be ahead of the curve <laughs> here with your mystery. Now, tell me, uh, you've written a number of mysteries. Yes. And how is the reception to You'll Never Know, Dear? How has that been? And how does it compare to, how do you feel it compares to some of your other books? Well, I think, I mean, I wrote five um, straight mystery novels. And, and I actually did your show ages ago with, uh, with those first books. They were mystery novels. Yes. I wrote with a co-author. Mm -hmm. There was this neuropsychologist as the main character. And writing a series um, is nice because you develop readership. People want to have the next book. Uh, publishers want a book a year, uh, which is, uh, for me, a lot. Yeah, um, that is I a know lot. romance writers turn out three or four a year. I don't know how they do it. Um, but, um, and then I wrote my first standalone, Working Alone, which was Never Tell a Lie. And I've been on that ever since. So now I'm five in. I just turned in the sixth. Uh, and it's just, it's just different, you know, to uh, uh, each book feels like, I mean, when you're writing a series, every book, you've got the same characters. You've got some issues that are carrying forward. You've got a cast uh, and then a mystery within it. Uh, but when you're starting all over every time, it's uh, it's a whole different thing. I really like it. Um, 
I think I'm still developing readership even though it's not the same characters every time. I think people have a sense of what a Hallie Efron book is, mm -hmm. and it's this kind of creepy suspense. But um, I try very hard in my books to walk the line between creepy and icky. Yes, and you do that beautifully. Thank you. Because mm -hmm. I don't like to read icky. Right. And I will not sub you know, allow, make my readers read icky. So for me, if there's, for instance, a rape in the story, it's not going to be depicted on the page. Yes. The aftermath, yes. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, the, the uh, damage. But not the, you know, I, I just, I just can't go there. Well, you I don't know, like I to write sex. I don't like to write violence. Well, you're so talented. You don't have to um, stoop to those kind of yeah. uh, gimmicks. Well, I wish I. I mean, I think you know. I'm trying to think who who there are. There are writers who do it really well. Right. I understand. Yeah. But I I happen to be another person, a reader who doesn't yeah. really like super graphic, no. painful, torturous things that live on in my imagination forever. Yeah. I would. Yeah. I like the thrill of suspense. Yeah and being led through the pages in a really creative way, which I think you do so well. And I so, like my reader to feel safe. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Now in the two minutes we have left, tell us what your next project is going to be about and how readers can find, viewers can find out more about you. Uh, so I'm working on a book. I just turned in a book for the third time. That's how it works, by the way. You finish mm -hmm. a book, you turn it in, you get back pages and pages, and then you revise it. So this was my third time. She just, I just got an email yesterday that said, you nailed it. Yes. It's called <laughs> Careful What You Wish For. Ooh. And that's the kind of title I like. Never tell a lie, come and find me, and so on. This one's Careful What You Wish For. And it's about a woman who, a former teacher, I was a former teacher, I used to teach third grade, uh, who uh, has a new career as a professional organizer, mm -hmm. you know, like Marie Kondo. Mm -hmm. She helps people con Marie their homes, get rid of all their unnecessary things, keeping only what speaks to your heart, etc. And she's married to a man who cannot drive past a yard sale without stopping. Oh. So, you know, they always tell you in a writing workshop, conflict. Yes. So she's trying to get rid of things. Meanwhile, he's going to yard sales and sneaking it down in the basement in the <laughs> Sounds attic. Sounds like me. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so she meets a woman who is also married to a man who's not well suited mm -hmm. to her. And they fantasize in a drunken evening about what they would like to do to their husbands. Oh. And so that's how it opens. I see. Yeah, I won't tell you what happens, but anyway, careful what you wish for. Oh my goodness, yeah, that's yeah, going to yeah. be another page turning that, to look I forward so. to. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Now, in the last few seconds that we have left, tell us how we can get more uh, information about you, Helen. Well, I'm on, I'm on the web. I, I have all my uh, events and uh, all kinds of stuff about the books at HallieEphron.com, H-A-L-L-I-E-E-P-H-R-O-N.com. And I'm also uh, blogging with Jungle Red Writers. I'm there with Hank, Philip yes, Ryan. Yes, and an award-winning blog. Seven, it is, it is. We've got a really big award this year. The, uh, Wonderful. The Anthony Award. Wonderful. So Jungle well, Red Writers. Jungle Red Writers, and our time's up. Unfortunately, we could talk to Hallie Efren all day long. Thank you for tuning in, and please scoop up her book because it is one of the most fabulous reads I have ever encountered, you'll never know, dear. Thanks for being with us today on It's All Right with Suzette.